their so-called privilege, and everyone who uses that word is the mortal enemy of C-suite executives. You just gotta hand it to them for telling everybody who your enemies are. You hear them use that word privilege, they're an enemy. Was and is in fact undeserved. All of us in the Western world were in a sense fortunate to be born here and now. This part I love because this is where you see a side of Jordan Peterson you don't normally see. This is where he's getting together and he's expressing gratitude. It just comes out kind of funny when he does it. When these vast educational resources and realms of computational power are available to us, when we will never have to ask, will we have enough to eat or will we have somewhere to rest our heads? And some of that is undeserved. None of us alive built the amazing cities, roadways, or industrial machinery that has brought about our wealth. Uh, I take objection to that. A lot of people have built some of the infrastructure that has been there today. You know, people are still building train tracks and uh, power lines and stuff like that. And, and part of it is computers and even universities. So he's got a funny way of expressing gratitude. All of us alive are the beneficiaries of the hard work of our ancestors and worse, have the temerity to thrive on the blood-soaked lands of plantation and imperialism and atrocity that make up the states, provinces, and countries that house, shelter, and protect us. This is, he's just so angry, it's hard to tell, but uh, it, it sounds to me like, first of all, he talks about our ancestors, which is uh, really a call out to our you know, um, families, as opposed to uh, the more anonymous people who might have done it, like immigrants and slaves. So it's just like sort of a, a subtle way of um, of dissing people who really brought us everything, while also sort of expressing gratitude. But it sounds more like he's trying to induce guilt. This is what I remember. You know, when when my mom would say, "You know, kids are starving in China when I didn't eat my supper," and so. We must atone, and rightly so, but we cannot and must not do this by bending a knee to the rabid centralizers and fulminating ignorant and resentful anti-capitalists who shake a moralizing fist in the air and object so loudly. Any uh, is this problem that they're objecting so loudly they have to be quieter about it? You know, just like, you know, you could have a voice, but just, like, not say that much. I mean, obviously, uh, the bend the knee references to Co Colin Kaepernick, who uh, went out of line by, you know, just a physical posture. Just the stance that he held his body in silently, not even shaking a fist and being loud. Just this posture is so intimidating to the whole, to the whole worldview. It's going to bring communism next. Anyone with more money than me is an oppressor. And this is a key point that I want to uh, focus on here. He says, he, so he's mocking the voices of people who are standing up for the oppressed. And he's putting the words in their mouth that they say, anyone who has more money than me is an oppressor. Uh, oppressor. Um, and, 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 you know, like I keep saying, he's not really trying to get you to think. He's just trying to get you to see things his way. Because if you think for a minute, look at the things that people are actually standing up for. Like, I'm not gay, but I stood up for gay marriage, right? Just because I'm a compassionate person, and it's got nothing to do with the money. In fact, a lot of gay people probably have more money than me. Um, so, you know, he's got this just, like, the way he controls the, the, the focus here is very manipulative. That is a very bad pathway. <laughs> This good, that bad. And just look at the explosive way he says bad. An oppressor. That is a very bad pathway. That is a bad that pathway. That is the true road to a future that no one except the devil himself wants. Again with this like devil and Satanistic and hell and damnable. Um, and actually this is, you know, people standing up for uh, others um, it's not just the devil who wants that. <laughs> it's, it's all of us who want that. So, if you are a CEO, 
and you are wringing your hands about the planet and you wake up at three in the morning upbraiding yourself for your shenanigans on the moral front, your untrammeled and narrowly self-serving greed in the service of your hedonism and narcissism. Okay, a lot of big words there. I think what's kind of interesting here is I realized, although this is a message to CEOs, um, this is where it, where it finally dawned on me, at least, that he's not really trying to talk to CEOs. Do you think any CEOs are like sitting here listening to this? Like the CEOs I know, they're already trying to make money. They're already trying to run their business. They're not going to listen to some like 25 year old guy tell them to, you know, you should make more money. They're like, that's that's my job. You know, that's my last like five jobs. That's why I got hired for this job. That's what I do. Then do what you must most truly do to become a better person. And then when he conjures these images about people being guilt racked, he's not really talking about, um, he's not really talking to CEOs. He's talking to ordinary people like you and me. And he's trying to put a picture in our heads that CEOs are actually guilty about all this. I don't think that they are. Even the evil ones, I don't think that they're guilty at all. I think the ones doing it for the, you know, doing good things are doing it because of compassion and because that's what customers are demanding. And the evil ones, I don't know, but the evil ones sure aren't racking their hair about the environment. If anything, they're racking their their nerves, staying up all night, worrying about um, people who are standing up for the environment. Justify your money and your unparalleled opportunities by becoming a shining light in the darkness. It is said, for unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Okay, yeah, so of course he's pulling out the Bible, you know, for um, its sort of uh, spiritual resonance and trying to say, you know, the Bible says this, so, you know, it must be true. And, but really, what, the, what that scripture is uh, stating isn't really all that, uh, all that unusual. You know, people who get a lot are going to have a lot demanded of them. Yeah, big whoop. Um, I'm more trying to understand in what tense or mode he's communicating to people now. Because I've already said he's not talking to CEOs. He's talking to people whom he wants to imagine uh, CEOs in their minds. Um, and he's and he's sort of being sarcastic, but he's also uh, sort of like using that sarcasm to say this is actually true. It's it's actually kind of complicated, what does overcomplicated. This mean? It means, as the rest of the Sermon on the Mount insists, that the way to pay for privilege is by doing the good that is commensurate with that privilege. So. You know, he already told us that everybody who uses the word is like privilege is like the devil or something like that. Or is not your friend. Um, but here he's validating this concept of privilege. So he's doing such a bad job at like making his ideas clear that he's actually kind of proving other people's point. He's saying like, yeah, okay, you have privilege. Now here, here's how to absolve yourself of the guilt. And like I said, I don't think that most people have the guilt about it. And this is the way out of the guilt. CEOs that CEOs. makes you such easy targets for the demented and satanic moralizing of the accuser. And that is just a pure shaming tactic. You know, he does this, uh, you know, oh, CEOs, you are easy targets. It's, um, it's actually interesting. I don't know if we got to that part, but he talks about uh, promoting like the male boy or the stock boy. And, and, I, and I think that these kinds of shame very ironically, those are tactics that some of the hardcore feminists actually use by trying to emasculate men, uh, by calling them boys, and, uh, you know, by saying, uh, you know, these people are, these people are ridiculing you. This is also, if you've ever read the book Games People Play, he, this is uh, the game called Let's You and Him Fight. He's trying to get people to fight his cause like why don't you go fight that person over there and I'll just sit in my clubhouse and make cranky videos are you wealthy be better do so much good with your money and your other privileges that when the mob comes 
you can say, I have devoted myself truly to the highest good and can stand innocent before you and my own conscience. So, yeah, he's trying to scare everybody and say, oh, a mob's going to come to your house. Uh, and then he's, he's, again, being so vague. He's just like, oh, do you have privilege? Well, then do good things. And, of course, you're not allowed to do good things the way you might want to. Let's say you want to get together with an international group and figure out ways to reduce carbon emissions. Well, you can do good, but you can't do that because, you know, you can't do anything political, you know. Like, you can't feed people. You know, that's, that's political. You have to just, like, you know, figure out some way to, to do good. And, of course, he's not going into that because what he's selling here is a daydream. This is magical thinking. What he's trying to say is, like, someone's going to listen to this and say, yeah, well, you know, those CEOs, they, they actually do good. And then, like, no one's going to ask, like, what, what good do they actually do? Because you know, they don't want to step out of line. They just want to listen to this guy. And... Um, and, and in fact, if you if you ask what some of the good that they that they did is, you might actually get the answer. Well, you know, they um, uh, sequestered some carbon, or you know, they offered free education to some underprivileged people, or something like that. But you know, he doesn't want to um, he doesn't want to you know people to to do that of their own volition or or, or something. He's he's conflicted. He doesn't have it figured out. And you mobsters have you looked to your own redemption have you borne the responsibility of your own unexamined privilege you who dwell equally in the exploitation and atrocity of the so-called imperialist west i love it i've just been told by jordan peterson to check my privilege as if it wasn't enough that i had my uh hardcore leftist friends telling me on facebook to check my privilege every time i open my mouth I've got Jordan Peterson has now adopted the practice. Let's just listen to that again, you mobsters. Responsibility of your own unexamined privilege, mm. you who dwell equally in the exploitation and atrocity of the so-called imperialist West. And uh, this is such a tired idea. Like you, you dwell entirely in in the same atrocities as if, like. I'm the one, like, slaughtering, you know, tons of people just because I live in the United States and pay my taxes. Um, not even going to go there. That's so tired. You know, he's, he, again, he's trying to, make, trying to make everybody else feel guilty. Actually, he's not even speaking to people like me. He's speaking to people who are the opposite of me, who, who dislike people like me. And he's trying to put words in their mouth so that they have something to say when they encounter me. He's trying to get his followers, when they encounter somebody who thinks or is on the left or in the center, that he's going to say, why don't you, yeah, tell them that they have privilege too. Just have them check their privilege. It, it's so ironic that he deploys these, um, you know, th these, these very same tactics that uh, he claims to despise. Who exactly are you to call me and my talent and privilege out in the name of God? I, that's exactly what I would just say to you. Who are you to t call my privilege out? As far as in the name of God, I, I think that's just kind of like a thing he adds to make something like more deep. Like, will you please put the dishes away in the name of God? Or, you know, uh, I actually want to watch Channel 61 in the name of God. I cannot help but think in closing that there is an appalling greed all right, before, before I let this play, he says, I can't help but think in closing. We're only on minute 17 of a 25-minute video, so his closing encompasses, uh, uh, encompasses approximately one-third of the whole entire video. It's like just when you thought that he would actually be closing. In all this D-I-E and E-S-G posturing. One of the things I found most intolerable about the Ivy League environment was the fostered narcissism of the students. All who gain entry to Yale or Harvard or Princeton or Stanford or even to the University of Toronto where I lectured for 20 years are already part of the elite by any standards historical and present. But they are enticed as an easy escape from their privilege, let's say, into identifying with the oppressed agitating 
in principle. So, you know, again, he's using these blanket statements. I mean, the Unabomber went to Harvard. Would you consider him part of the elite? Um, not everyone who goes there actually has a lot of privilege, you know. Uh, my friend's sister went there. Um, I think she's just a writer raising kids. You know, she's not very elite. Um, <laughs> they also offer a lot of scholarships to people. I'm not, like, trying to make a case for how awesome they are. But, you know, you weaken your argument when you paint all of these universities as, uh, as identical. But, you know, really what he's trying to do is... Um, is blur the lines between people who like say go to undergrad at Harvard for like communications or writing or something and like people who actually like run the world like the people at these G17 meetings and maybe there's some overlap but that doesn't mean like all of them do you know on their behalf and atoning for their good fortune purchased at the cost in no small part of the atrocity of the past with the reflexive and thoughtless activism whose promotion has come to substitute for genuine apprenticeship and education. <laughs> I think what he's saying there is that uh, students go to school and they just uh, act like activists and don't actually learn anything. Uh, I don't think that statement holds up on scrutiny. You know, I've worked with a couple of people from Harvard and they're actually pretty smart you know and, and not even many of them were activists I think a lot more of them generally are kind of going towards that to that government or that leadership route and stuff this means that the new elite the youthful privilege get to have their cake and eat it too they have all the stature and opportunity bestowed upon them and available to them as a consequence of their university affiliation and the hard work and ability that was required to open those doors. And then also, all the moral high ground that accrues to the unjustly oppressed. That. So I guess what he's trying to say is that these students, uh, they identify with the oppressed. Um, I, I think he's confused about what identify means here. I think there's standing up for the oppressed, and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's very good to stand up for the oppressed. You can argue about who's actually oppressed and stuff like that. But I, I think he's trying to say that these people, they go to fancy parties and they get to say that they are oppressed themselves. Um, I, I wish he would give some examples here instead of just, you know, wagging his finger. It's just too much. That is just asking too much to be privileged and victimized simultaneously. Just as it's too much for university professors to ask. And even more so, as it's too much for CEOs and other denizens of the executive suite to request. So, stop saving the world with the centralizers, globalists, narcissists, and eternal builders of the Tower of Babel. So once again, he's uh, using that clumsy metaphor to Tower of Babel and telling people, stop saving the world. Uh, you know, he's going to say, like, do good, but don't save the world. Or if you do good and save the world, don't save it with these other people. Like, you know, s save it in your own way without, you know, listening to climate scientists, I guess, is his message. Um, but, but like I said, he's not really about people, like, uh, doing anything about it. He's just about them satisfying their own conscience stand forth instead as i said as proudly evil capitalists do your fiduciary duty provide your customers and clients with what they need and want yeah um i i think he's basically being a male karen here <laughs> he's just like you're a business owner go and make money um, if you think business owners are not concerned with making money, <laughs> then you're just really far out of touch. And let the great invisible hand, that immense computational device, play its necessary role. Make your enterprise productive and profitable. Make yourself generous and abide by the dictates of your conscience. 
do enough signal good. Now that I I had to listen to that like four times. Do enough signal good. Do enough signal good. I he's saying it so intentionally. I think he means it, but I really can't parse that. It, it sounds to me like he's saying like do enough, and then a separate sentence like signal good, or signal an adjective here like you should do enough signal good. Because it sounds like he's telling people that that they should virtue signal like that's an order like go and make money signal good or, or this whole thing is just in a whole entire sarcastic speech bubble like I said he's uh, he's just so mad you can't tell so that your great wealth rests lightly on your shoulders this is a more difficult task take note than generating that wealth itself. Put the human resources D.I.E. personnel back in their place. I like the way he's saying, you know, look, it's going to be much harder to uh, clear your conscience than it actually was to make all that, as if he knows anything about that. I mean, he's just like a small-time celebrity media guy. I don't think he has much experience... Um, getting people to have a clear conscience who have like great wealth maybe he had some clients like that in his practice but you know without really delving into anything about it he's just kind of talking out of his butt and trying to sound uh, try, trying to sound wise using this uh, pseudo religious language stop hosting faux democratic town halls since when do you care what the stock boys think yeah, there we go. That's where he's doing that emasculating thing, like saying, oh, the stock boys. Um, yeah, you know, if, if a business owner wants to have a town hall, I think they should just have it if they want to, not because Jordan Peterson said to or said not to. You know, these people, they, they run their own businesses. And... In a few decades, if they have the fortitude, ability, and industriousness, they will be sitting in your hard-won place and making the decisions that you are currently charged with making. That's just like a total non sequitur. Like, a lot of people who comment on Jordan Peterson note, he switches tracks a lot. And so now he's kind of, it's, it's just an aside, but he's kind of left behind all these ideas about hierarchy and privilege and stuff like that. And he's just focusing on meritocracy. Oh, this, this you know... Presumably, low-level employee is going to be, you know, in the top position someday. And I think that's just, you know, trying to just speak to his audience. They're all the people who are just uh, hoping that they, too, can get rich someday. Did you not earn that right? Then why forego it under moral pressure? And if the answer is guilty conscience, then straighten yourself out. Get your oppressive superego under control. <laughs> I had to laugh that. I mean, this is like the most like world record projecting right here. Get your massive superego under control. Straighten yourself out. Get your oppressive superego under control. Um, that's exactly what you need to do, Jordan. Or stop doing those possibly terrible and unworthy things that make you guilty when the mob knocks at your door. And, and here, it's, it's almost creepy, like when he's saying, stop doing those things that are making you guilty. Like, is, he, is this the whole God is watching you masturbate argument? Like, is he trying to make me feel ashamed or embarrassed for, like, something that I do? You know, he's already tried to put it in my mind, like, oh, guilty CEOs, guilty CEOs. Well, they're obviously guilty because of something that they're doing. And, you know, he's like looking at you like, I know what you're doing. I can see inside of your mind and you'd better stop. And while you're at it, tell your HR people to take a hike. Stop making obeisance to the alphabet brigade. Stop educating your customers, remember them, as to what political opinions are acceptable. Uh, yeah, okay, so we totally switched tracks here. Um, absolutely no transition whatsoever. But when he talks about the Alphabet Brigade, the first time he said it, I thought he was referring to the company formerly known as Google, and he was whining about big tech. 
but this time I watch it, I'm realizing, oh, he's referring to LGBTQIA plus whatever, haha. -ha. It's so funny, so many different uh, initials. Yep, that's clever, alphabet. Um, so, obey sense to the, uh, to the LGBTQ brigade. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, I, I'm still, when I hear this, I'm thinking, you know, if I had a nice business, I'd be like, I'm gonna do what I want with my business. You know, if, if you don't like it, well, you know, I have my freedom, and you can talk all you want, but you know, you haven't been very, very persuasive to me. And at the same time, if I had my business, I'd be like, hey, let's be realistic here. A lot of gay and whatnot people use my product. I should listen to what they have to say, right? Like Sam selling, I don't know, anything like soap, right? And people make ads and it's always like a man and a woman. It's always a man and a woman, right? Maybe some ads should be about a man and a man or a woman and a woman in a household buying soap. It's not crazy to think about it. And I'm not going to not do that just because Jordan Peterson says I'm going to make less money. I mean, heck, I'm likely going to make a lot more money doing that. Plus, it's just compassionate, you know? I might not have thought about it like 10, 20 years ago. But yeah, actually, you know, gay people probably do want to see themselves on TV from time to time, if not as much as everyone else. Stop with the full communist pretense, unless you want to go there. <laughs> what is that, like some kind of threat? Like, and what is this faux communist pretense? Am I doing faux communist pretense? Um, you know, later on in this video, he's going to introduce his pledge and he wants you to take his pledge. That to me seems like a faux fascistic pretense. So, you know, once again, it's about him projecting. He's like, don't, don't do this stuff because I want to do it. And if you do, think again, sunshine. <laughs> what a creepy psycho. Think again, sunshine. Like, this is like straight out of Dirty Harry. You know those like movies from the 80s where the bad guys always had like a cool line like Schwarzenegger? And, uh, you know, um, what's his name? The Dirty Harry guy. You know, they just all had these, these cool lines. Think again, sunshine. Although, you know, he's just he's just not really pulling it off in the, the pink shirt. So, sorry to say, but, you know, <laughs> you're not looking really tough there. And, you know, you're not looking very resilient there. You, you're looking pretty darn reactive. Um, and you, you're really sniveling is what you're doing. I mean, you're really looking like a, a sore loser. But you're a sore loser at a game. You, you're inventing yourself. You're not even playing the right game. You're just cranky. Stop pretending that there are 150 different genders and that it is your job to be so compassionate toward all narcissistic outsiders that you tempt children into ill-advised and terribly destructive surgery. All right, cool. So now we're negotiating about gender. So he says, stop pretending there's 150. So, okay, yeah, how about if I whittle that down to 100 gender genders? Can we do that, Jordan? Is 100 too many for you? Make the following pledge. Oh, here comes the pledge. I will rename human resources, personnel, as those who performed that role were known in the so sensible 1950s. Oh yeah, the so sensible 1950s, when everyone was so terrified of nuclear war and traumatized from World War II that they were just scared into like mind-numbing conformity. And all these people came back with trauma from the war, those who weren't dead. Th this. You know, a lot of people look back to that as uh, as a special point in our history, but it's not really that great. That's pre-civil rights era. Um, it's just a it's just a bad time. I mean, that's when television came out. It's not all it was cracked up to be. I know that there's some cool old nostalgic movies and TV shows, but that's not really like a terrific era to go back in time to. I mean, I think there's a lot more. In, in exciting times in the country like say uh, the 20s when you look at all the music that was coming out and all the dance or even like the early 1900s when the Industrial Revolution was changing or like the the 1910s in New York when there's just like like just bustling with people I think there's a lot of interesting eras but you know th this is a dog whistle to a certain uh, generation 
you know, people who think that World War II was like the greatest thing since sliced bread, you know, the war where we cooperated with the communists and where we didn't even go in and rescue Europe until we'd figure out a way to profit off of it. But um, people, and, and, and you know, to some extent, I can't blame them because I would love to have like some nice warming, loving memory. Like, you know, I remember when I was a little kid, my mom would make me pancakes with like apples and blueberry and butter. And I love that memory. That was sweet. I wish I could go back to that all the time. And I still do make pancakes like that sometimes. But, um, you know, that's what they're trying to, to appeal and just say, oh, the 1950s was everything smooth and lovely. Well, it wasn't um, sunshine. I will dispense forthwith with all the diversity, inclusivity, and equity consultants, flotsam, and jetsam. Wow, I will dispense with all the inclusivity. Wow, that's um, it's quite, quite the statement, you know? I mean, he could just say whites only, but, you know, in, in this, this pledge form, it's like, I will dispense with all the people telling me to be inclusive and uh and you know incorporate diversity into my business that's that's right up there with this ethically depopulate ourselves um i don't know kind of a creepy guy those who have allowed themselves to be possessed by that ideology are not your friends again with the division you know he's not trying to help you learn anything or, or think for yourself or you know, it's emasculating to his listeners to say, these people are not your friends. Um, you know, there's a, there's a famous um, German knife. Hang on. Okay, I was going to look something up, but I couldn't find it. We'll find it later. Are not your friends. Not your friends. And if you are consorting with them to look good for reasons of greed and vanity, then think again, once again. Because the system of ideas that animates the woke moralists is dead set and in the most serious manner against you and everything you stand for. Once again, trying to pick a fight and also to like speak for um, these woke moralists. As, as far as I know, these woke moralists are operating out of compassion and fairness, which is part of the reason this whole country, this, this country was uh, created in the first place particularly when you are being genuinely good. So yeah, that's that's just like another reference to um, it's complicated, but, but basically systematic racism is this idea that even if you're, you know, you think you're being good, you don't always know that you're excluding um, minorities, right? And this is, is a very interesting thing. I, I really wish that when it was came out, it wasn't called systematic racism. I wish it was called like diversity or, or systematic disinclusion or something else. Because as soon as you bring up the word racism, nobody wants to be called a racist. Um, and they're just immediately going to reject it. So it's kind of like a case of bad design. Um, but basically, he's just trying to get people to say... Uh, say, well, I'm generally good. I feel good. You know, people like me. I have friends, so I can't be doing anything wrong, and so I don't have to do anything differently. You know, pe people like me. I'm nice. You know, I leave a tip at the uh, coffee shop, so, you know, I, I return lost keys to the police, so I don't have to, you know, hire diverse people at all. Uh, it just doesn't even, it doesn't even cover it. More but yeah, let, let's go on with this pledge. And this is one of my favorite parts. More pledge. Genuinely. Good. More pledge. <laughs> he legitimately just said, more pledge. <laughs> I had to listen to this like five times. Did he really say more pledge? Good. More pledge. Yep, he said more pledge. <laughs> So th that is just like not generally how people talk. So I even, uh, you know, wanted to look it up. Okay, so first of all, oops, this is another word I had to look up. So I had to look up the word pledge to see if it actually can be used as a quantitative uh, 
down like water like more water <laughs> or uh more normally use a plural though, like more french fries so it'd be like more pledges or another pledge like a solemn promise a thing that is given but you know jordan peterson is calling for more pledge good more pledge all right good buddy here you go i got some pledge for you i got a whole bunch of pledge here i got all the all the pledge you could ever want. Look at this. I even got you a, a coupon for pledge, okay? You could save 20%. Okay, I looked that up. A maven is just an expert or a connoisseur. Isn't saving your company enough? Do you really have to so casually and thoughtlessly save the world too? <laughs> Why are you telling me what to do with my business? If I want to save the world, I have my own choice. And guess what? My customers want to see me save the world, so that's what I'm gonna do. Have some humility and stay in your already plenty large wheelhouse. So there he seems bitter if I have a large wheelhouse, like if I knew a lot of things. Um, so I have to have humility? Like what is this in respect to? Like to think that I can't also hire people because I only know how to make telephones or sell insurance or something like that? That's nonsense. That's exactly what those experts are there for, to teach us how to do it. And more on the pledge front. Oh, good, because, you know, we need another pledge, just like the good old German pledge. I will pay some more attention to the realm of philosophical, even theological, ideas. As I said, and as so many are insisting, we are in a conceptual war. All right, so... My pledge is I will pay attention to more philosophical and spiritual things. Like, I can't go into the political. But, oh yeah, the uh, philosophical and spiritual is totally fair game. CEOs, and it goes all the way to the bottom. What side do you want to be on when the chips are down? See, more of this just divisive language. He doesn't really have a, any solutions. He doesn't know how to go forward. Don't be thinking you can play both sides against the middle. He's just such a Bond villain. Don't be thinking like this. Don't get no ideas now. The deepest chasms of hell are reserved for those who play that game. Yeah, you're definitely an expert on hell and the deepest chasms. And, and yeah, yeah the, the, the people who aren't spiritual or whatever, they're the ones who are going to be going to hell um yeah no I, I don't i don't think so and you know you could say that we don't know much about the environment but i would say that you don't know much about hell and we haven't even had people um research hell as much as we've had in the environment so i think this kind of leads to like the problem with his worldview is that he takes this faith-based spiritual approach and so he thinks that, in his own narcissistic way, everyone else is doing that with science. He doesn't see science as a, uh, a community operation or function, a, a bunch of things that people do and cross-check each other and, and publish their results. So, you know, we're not to believe climate scientists, but we're totally supposed to believe all this spiritual stuff on faith. <laughs> now, I'm not going to deny my own spirituality, but that's a discussion for another time. Don't be thinking either that you can cheaply escape from the burdens of your responsibility with all that money and so-called power. 